Writing is my favorite thing to do. Have you heard about the Gateway to Publishing Conference and Convention? They'll have writing workshops, writing classes, and more. June 16th through 18th, 2017, at the Renaissance Airport Hotel in St. Louis, Missouri. Cool! Where can I sign up? Go right now to www.stlwritersguild.org and click on GatewayCon. www.stlwritersguild.org and click on GatewayCon? That's right. See you there. Right Pack Radio a podcast produced by Winding Trails Media for writers by writers. Writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the right pack. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host and producer, David Allen Lucas, author of Crazy Things, president of St. Louis Writers Guild, president of Winding Trails Media, and currently working on getting his novel, which is a space western, out the door. And up to publish, so by September, knock on wood. Woohoo! Yeah, we'll see. Do it, I'm chasing. And with me today is not my lovely co host because she's not here today, but we do have our Madame of Murder. (laughs) I like that new nickname, I just came up with it last episode. So (laughs) I hear, yes. Like it to be a lot of things. Apparently, I'm also the queen of sass and heaven knows what else. <laughs> well, I'm Fedora Amos. I write Victorian Who Done It's like Jack the Ripper in St. Louis and Mayhem at Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Also, on the 6th of May, is this going to be out before then? I think so. Okay, cool. On the 6th of May, you can come and hear me tell you all about poisons. And I'm not talking just about writers, but certainly two writers. And I will tell you how to protect yourself from poisons and how poisons actually can be good for you and all kinds of wonderful stuff like that. It will be at the Lodge of De Pair, mm-hmm. 10 o'clock on Saturday, May the 6th. I am George Soroy. I am the Vice President of the Missouri Writers Guild. And uh, since this is airing before May 6th, then I can still tell you that we have... Um, that I'm looking forward to seeing all of you at the Missouri Writers Guild 2017 conference, which will be at the Holiday and Executive Center in Columbia, Missouri, May 5th through the 7th. Uh, we still have several hotels that, so, uh, several hotel rooms that are open. Um, we look forward to seeing you there. It's going to be a blast. It's going to be a whole lot of, whole lot of fun, and um, and you'll get to meet me while I have. Um, while I am pulling my hair out, dealing with everything that's going on, but still having a blast. Um, I am also an author of science fiction for the young adult reader. Uh, both of my uh, Excelsior novels, Excelsior and, Ex- and Ever Upward, part two in the Excelsior journey, will be out in May and June of 2017. My five part serial from Parts Unknown will be out in paperback and ebook later on this year. And I'm also a uh, ex- getting to be more and more of an experienced audiobook narrator. I am currently narrating Argentum, Volume 2 of Pause by Debbie Mamber Kupfer. And just going to mention, since you were talking about time and wanting to know when this aired, as we always record in the past, this is airing two weeks before the Missouri Writers Conference, so you've got two weeks to sign up. And I really hope that there are no more hotel rooms yeah, <laughs> back yeah. at that point. So. <laughs> yes, and also with us today is... My name is Jennifer Solzer. I'm a children's book author and illustrator. My premier fantasy novel, Threadcaster, is available on Amazon. Any book and paperback. I've also got picture books and hopefully even more forthcoming. I don't know when my short story will be published, but there's a Threadcaster-themed short story coming out. And uh, check the check the right pack page, I suppose, for that, and we find out more. But that's an exciting thing that I have. And also with us, um, my name is Chanel Etienne. I write sometimes, um, just sometimes, uh, <laughs> genres including science fiction and fantasy. And also with us, I'm Melanie Lucas. I write 
science fiction, fantasy, and nonfiction. Also, too, I did fail to mention on my go round, so I'm going to say it now, especially now after George's announcement about Missouri Writers Guild. We also have Gateway to Publishing Conference and Convention, Readers Convention, Writers Conference, occurring in St. Louis the week of June 16th, 17th, and 18th. It'll be at the Renaissance Hotel. Come, be, we are creating a unique experience. We will have agents, editors, produ- and publishers taking pitches. We will have workshops. We will have master classes. And we will have a free book fair going on with author panels and so forth. This again is occurring June 16th, 17th, 18th. If somebody is worried about missing Father's Day, buy a book, get it signed, take it to them, and you'll be done. And you'll be leave, you'll be gone before noon on that. On that Sunday. Sunday. Yeah. So, for more information, and you probably already have heard the advertisement before I mention it, but go to www.stlwritersguild.org and click on the little blue thing called Gateway Con. And today we're going to talk about um, finding your story structure. Now, some people don't have trouble finding story structures when they're getting ready to write. Some people find it when they're writing them, and others, well, they juggle. So, (laughs) Could we start by defining what are you talking about? What is story structure? Okay, that works. Story structure is how you structure your story. I know, I just did a complete total. (laughs) That's a tautology. Total, yes, I know I did that. So let me (laughs) me go. In other words, listener, you're out of luck. (laughs) No, actually, actually, give me a second. Okay. I actually do a seminar on constructing story and I talk about seven different story structures. We are all familiar with Aristotle's proposed story structure, the three act play or the three act structure. In structure one you're you're kinda of going through the beginning of a story, act one is story structure, beginning, introducing the inciting incident, some second thoughts, and then ooh hey we've got a climax of act one. But you're still building and in Act 2, you go, oh, here's an obstacle, here's another obstacle. You get to the midpoint where you get some huge big twist. Another obstacle, then suddenly disaster and crisis occur. Um, this could be, I borrow from Bat. I don't know what books everybody's read, so I'm going to talk about movies. Batman, The Dark Knight Rises. Um, the end of Act 2 is where Batman finally gets climbs out of the well of its, that giant prison. Um, then you go into Act 3, which is the final, is the ascending action. You get all the fighting going on. He say, he, yes, spoiler alerts, but if, guys, if you really haven't seen this by now, come on. Um, he pulls a nuclear bomb out of Gotham City. Things blow up, and then we get up to the wrap-up in the ending. That's your three-act story structure. That's what is actually, that's what I was taught back in high school for story structure. That's the only one they ever talked about, but there's a lot of other ones out there. There is a variation called the five act structure. I've got to get down on my PowerPoint presentation. That's, uh, that. that's also known, Shakespeare, right? Uh, no, it's called the Freytag mo- ma- uh, model. I um, think Shakespeare used the three act. I think he did. No, use, five. No, did he use five? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yay. <laughs> and then after, then beyond that, you've and it basically follows the same general structure. You've got the hero's journey structure, and you have the heroine's journey structure. I find that one interesting. Uh, you know, where, now, at now, what point does she find a man? Hold that thought. <laughs> the hero's journey starts off with ordinary call, the ordinary world. Let's, let's go and use um, Lord of the Rings. Or actually, let's use The Hobbit. So, ordinary world, we see Bilbo, right? Yes. I get Bilbo and yes. Frodo going by, back in my head. Back Bilbo is Hobbit. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I paused for a second. like, wait a minute. I'm going to screw the characters up. <laughs> Bilbo's sitting around at his home. He's getting read and... Everything's just normal. He, this is his normal life, which is completely, totally boring. Up comes Gandalf. Guess what? We want to go on an adventure. And Bilbo goes, uh, or, yeah, Bil- Fro- Fro- 
Proto goes, uh, um, uh, no! Wait, no, wait, wait, no, wait, 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 they um, eventually there's lots of tests. They have these seven. They have these seven dwarfs. No, twelve dwarfs. All the dwarfs. <laughs> <laughs> As I was, I am screwing this up, and I apologize because I'm trying to think multiple things. And of course, Gun Gandalf appears to die. We won't. No, no, no I, now I'm in the wrong one. Now I am. Go back we got. We got to make sure. We got to make sure to tag Tolkien <laughs> for the metadata, so that way we can get a lot I, more <laughs> listens. I am <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I am screwing up the story. Lot of comments. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we'll get. We'll get. Wow, I've we'll got lots. Of I've got the, the entire comments. series intermixed in my head, and I apologize. Oh, oh, Star Wars. We always do. Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, I know. Anyway, I'm too late. Anyway, um, I think. Okay, sorry. Anyway, he. They go to the brink of death. They eventually start on the road back, and then they come back, and the character returns to the Shire. Knows I avoided that. It no, avoided the name mix up. <laughs> and from there, he actually will eventually pick on the next character for the next adventure. Okay, from a heroine's journey, <laughs> technically, all of that just happened, and that's the beginning. Well, then she finds a man. No. <laughs> <laughs> then her mother and, and her mother grosses about how she's never going to have grandchildren. <laughs> she has a separation from feminine. This is um, who did this? Hang on. Yes, give me someone that I can gross about later. Um, the heroine's journey was developed by Marion Murdoch. Is that a male Marion or a female Marion? As far as I know, female. <laughs> it doesn't so. matter. If it's terrible, they will still receive. Absolute crap for it. <laughs> yeah. The heroine separates from the feminine, um, identifies with the masculine, go- gathering allies, road, road or trips, meeting ogres and dragons, and so forth. There's other, and I'm going to continue before I get jumped on here. <laughs> she's not holding a stick right Yeah, she's not holding a walking stick. But, and really, I want to move on because there's, I've got seven here. You've got the story planner. Um, if you listen to our last episode, we talked about Twine as a piece of software. But basically what this is, is you set the scene, you introduce characters, conflicts and problems, story development, redemption, solution, and a story ending. And these are note cards that you use to do okay. this. Okay, uh, wait a minute. So stop. This has kind of gotten rambling. So what is it about the feminine... I'm avoiding the further conversation on that one at this point. Because, although, this is, you know, for my apologies, everybody, this has been like 11 minutes into this thing, <laughs> and I am giving you a very fast version of a one-hour presentation. Can, can you just give us a list of the different story structures? Well, and I'm, that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> okay. So, the synopsis structure. This is where you write your story by synopsis, as a synopsis. So, short version, you can do this for every chapter, but you're writing for proverbial writers, I'm sorry, uh, TV Digest version of what's happening in that chapter. Snowflake, oh my god, this thing is, Snowflake is a, is a type of story structure that blossoms as you go. It starts off, you tell, you write a sentence using absolutely no character's name about the story. Um, Star Wars. Fine. I've been bent to it. Mm-hmm. Um, a young farmer goes off to, has to leave home and save the universe from an evil, um, destructive weapon that's been created by an empire. That would be the sentence. And then from there, you start building up your character, you start identifying your characters. So then from there, you rewrite your synopsis with each of the characters, and you build this up a chapter by chapter, and eventually it just really gets big. That's the short version of it. I've actually used it. It is very time consuming. And then moving on, there is a type in which I am absolutely most familiar with, and that is a zero draft structure. You have no idea what your story structure is going to be, but you're going to discover it as you write your story. Is that what the title of the episode comes from? No. Um, but yes. I'm trying but to no. Participate. But yes. <laughs> No, it actually comes from an article out there. But basically, 
where I'm going to go with this, since I, since I was asked to define the structures, my question to you guys is, how do you how do you find your story structure? Do you use only one type of story structure across all your stories? Do you adapt? Do you find that sometimes you're writing the wrong structure? And go. <laughs> um, I I tried you know a couple different a couple different things with Excelsior. I wanted to. I went into that story wanting to tell my own interpretation of the hero's journey. So I knew the basics, the basic points that went to that. The only thing I didn't really... Do, I mean, there's a, there's a bit of the refusal of the journey, but, you know, like for the most part, you know, like that part is, you know, it's kind of glossed over to the point where my character is just kind of unsure about where he is in this world. You know, like where... That's as much of a refusal as as he winds up getting, and there are certain moments here and there where he does hesitate. But at the same time, he does eventually, you know, keep uh, pushing forward. Um, when I wrote from Parts Unknown, however, that was more that played out more like a zero draft kind of structure. Um, I knew the character, I knew the setting, I knew what I wanted to do with it, um, how that would eventually come to pass. I would figure that out, um, especially when I did the rewrites and it became such a large story that I made the decision to break it up into a five-part serial. Um, but that was my that that was that so far has been my experience regarding structure. I want to say something about a different kind of structure that you didn't mention at all. I have more than one of these, actually, that you didn't mention. Well, no, yeah, I only covered seven. <laughs> uh, and that is there. the stream of consciousness one that was there. very popular for a time. Something like Marcel Proust's Les Recherches de Temps Perdu. There we go. I'm glad she said it. I, I was screwed <laughs> that up so badly. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake, books like that, which simply take off in no particular order and go in no particular order and are very difficult to follow. I'm not saying I advocate that. I'm saying that that is a, a yet another story structure that one can use, which you might say is kind of an amorphous story structure. So anybody really, you don't have to follow any specific pattern or any of the patterns we're talking about. You can do what you want. In fact, I'm kind of glad you said that because I'm going to say, a long time ago, I, I learned Earl Stanley Gardner's writing plot method. And it had spoiled and destroyed my love for not only some of his work, but uh, Scott Carroll <coughs> and some other mystery writers' work because I could see that even if they didn't know Stanley's, Earl Stanley Gardner's method, I could see it going through, and I could identify exactly when something was going to happen and so forth. That's one of the problems that can happen with story structure. If you follow it's it, it's too predictable. It's yeah. very predictable. If I'm, if I'm able to predict a story, I'm going to put the book down, mm -hmm. and that's a bad thing. So, but since we're talking about finding your story structure, I'm back to the same question. Yeah, and feel free to other story structures. How do you decide how to tell your story? I don't really think that hard about it, honestly. Uh, I've got a chip on my shoulder going into this episode because I, uh, I've i had my, my work almost ruined before by people telling me that I wasn't doing it right. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, future people who want to blackmail me, if you want to get under my skin and make me freak out, you, you tell me I'm not doing it right and that there's a proper way that I've ignored and I'll sabotage myself every single time. So I'm not a fan of following a specific structure. I suppose in that way, I guess I'm a zero draft because I just go with whatever feels like it needs to happen in my story. I let my character drive me. You do that thing where you look your character in the eye and you say, what's your biggest fear? What's the thing that's going to happen that's going to ruin you? And then you do that. And you figure out how that goes. And uh, I always work toward an ending because I already know what the ending of whatever story I'm working on is going to be. And uh, that's what makes me a plotter, is I plot it out in, in terms of, uh, I know that this is going to have to happen at this point for the black moment, because I know this character and what I'm trying to do, 
I know that this is how it's going to end, and I know I need to set up a reason for why this is a big reveal throughout the rest of it, and that's how we fill in the rest of the story. Uh, whether it falls into a hero's journey, or a coming-of-age story, or a heroine story, or whatever, uh, that's pure coincidence, and uh, just shows that I'm a good student of the, um, the storytelling genre, because I've observed it happening well in other places that I respect, and incorporated that into my internal library. I have a question regarding regarding structure. There is one uh, one series that I know that you know a lot of us mm -hmm. hold near and dear to our hearts, and that would be the Indiana Jones series. Mm -hmm. um, that really has like its own kind of structure because you you know you introduce your your character you know like uh, mm -hmm. in some form of action, and then you have that period where they're taking a breath, and then all of a sudden they figure out. You know they are figured. Um, they're given their new challenge, which is going to take up the rest of the story. Mm -hmm. And then you know, piece by piece by piece, they're going from place to place to place and picking up things along the way, and basically just kind of making their way to a accomplishing that goal. Is there a specific structure that that is that that's based around? My Almost like like, yes. an like an yes, adventure yes. type of. My my answer would be yes, and considering that George Lucas wrote the, co-wrote the first one, mm -hmm. I I did check double check the credits on the other two, but well, he he came up with the stories for yeah. all four of them. Okay, um, for better. Or I would say yeah. more than likely because this is what he used for Star Wars. I thought it was a hero's journey that he used as a story structure for. it. Partly, but action adventure stories mm -hmm. from way back when have had a what is called a picaresque mm. structure in which. The a character who is typically larger than life, like Indiana Jones, mm -hmm. is confronted with problem after problem, and mm -hmm. he moves all over solving these problems. Yeah. And that's a picaresque structure, and it goes back as far as you want to go back. Yeah, because it was based. Actually, it was based on. It was based on the Ulysses, adventure serials. Yes. Of, you know, like, I mean, go back with, to the like, ancient Greeks. Further back, you know, like, yeah, but you know, like, when, all the way back. When it came to you know, like wanting to do that, you know, specific story, it was based on the adventure serials from the nineteen forties. Right. So it it had to be like in that same sort of in that same sort of like very um, s v very set structure where you have like one you know like one um, uh, one obstacle uh -huh. and then followed by like the next obstacle and the next one and the next one because they were serials. Uh -huh. So it was you know it was you only saw like a little chunk of it each week and end with a cliffhanger. Yes. So they come back to the movie theater next week. Exactly. You know, so I I don't see I don't see Indiana Jones as a real hero's journey because he starts and finishes pretty much the same you know almost the same way the closest one that I feel like he really um, I mean granted I think with Temple of Doom and Last Crusade he definitely has a you know like an actual exactly. arc um, but with like Raiders of the Lost Ark and everything like which I find funny that I'm saying arc yeah I was um, holding my I was that's holding what my I, I saw that yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, for the most part, you know, like, he doesn't change as much, you know, like, the way that, say, like, Luke Skywalker changes. Sure. Um, you know, like, I see that one as, like, a more, definitely a more uh, Picaresque, you know, type of type of structure, as Fedora mentioned. And as I said, they those all go back to the epics of ancient times, like uh -huh. Ulysses, which mm -hmm. is the same structure. And yeah. A, yeah, Hero's Journey does the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I would... Uh, add another kind to throw in here. Since I write mysteries, it's not a structure exactly, but it is a set of expectations that mystery readers and mystery listeners and mystery writers all have in common. That is, at the beginning of the book, you will have some mysterious kind of problem. You will have a murder, for example. And that you know, everybody knows that this has to get solved sometime along the course of the way. And you also know that it's not going to be easy. So there are various complications, red herrings, various possible uh, killers. And all of these have to be resolved before you can get to actually solving the murder and then figuring him, sending him off to jail or whatever happens to them. And then the story ends. So it's a set of expectations, I think, more than a rather specific structure. I was going to say mysteries have one of the most, for some reason romances do too, but for mysteries it's kind of more necessary that they have a structure. For example, 
except if the people tend to complain about it if it's if you don't meet the bad guy until the last chapter. Exactly. If, yeah. if the guy, you have to play fair. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's so another for instance, expectation. Yeah, reader expectation. Based on that, you have to structure it in certain ways. You have to meet the suspects in the first half of the book. So the first half of the book, you introduce the story. The second half of it, you can be working on the crime needs to happen in the first half of the story, usually too. Maybe not the whole crime, but at least parts of it. There are exceptions to that. Mm -hmm. But you have to have some idea of being able to solve it. You know, well, I think that the, that you talked about romance having structure yeah. too. Mm -hmm. It's a little different, and once again, I think it's a set of expectations more than anything mm -hmm. like a realistic sort of structure, because you have to meet the uh, the man and woman or man and man or whatever your couple is going to be, and they have to have problems that are going to keep them separate, and these problems have to get bigger and bigger as time goes on but then their love eventually overcomes and we get the happily ever after. So once again, it's a set of expectations which leads to a kind of structure, yes. Um, just, to, just to throw this out, since uh, Melanie was talking about, um, about expectations and how you don't want to meet the bad guy until mm -hmm. the very end. Um, no, you do want them to meet the bad guy before the oh, end. Oh, that's what I mean, yeah, like, that's what I mean. Yeah, like in, um, there's, one, there's one little exception that I will throw out there, even though like they, um, they knew that they were going into that, you know, basically like breaking that rule. Mm -hmm. um, but it still wound up becoming a very effective story. Is one that I hold near and dear to my heart, which is the original Friday the 13th. Uh, because people tend to forget that that was a whodunit. Mm -hmm. That what you know, like you, that from, for three fourths of that movie, all of the, all of the kills that, that happened, you know, like took place in the POV of the killer. Um, you didn't really see pretty much anything of them and everything, and then all of a sudden, when the last uh, character, Alice, was was running away, all of a sudden, out comes Betsy Palmer, making her first appearance in that whole movie, basically saying, I'm Mrs. Voorhees, a good friend of the Christie's. And as you get to, as they have their conversation, all of a sudden you realize she's been the one doing the killing all along. And, uh, spoiler alert... But um, if you haven't seen it by now, you're really in trouble. Go yeah, <laughs> but you know, like every now, you know, like there is every now and then there is that exception, and, and it's one of those things where it's just like if it's pulled off well enough, then you know, then it can be forgiven. But at the same time, it's not something that you want to go into. Yeah, you know, with that in mind. Well, that's horror. That's Psycho. not mystery. Yeah. Go away, George. <laughs> no. There was there Psycho. was a mystery element because it was a yeah. whodunit. Yeah. Well, of course, yeah. there's a mystery element in everything, yeah. but that doesn't make it a mystery. I don't think. No, but uh, Hitchcock broke the rules in Psycho quite a bit, uh, but he did it very intentionally. Yeah. It's not that he didn't know what the rules were. It's he knew what the rules because were. Because that is a, a thriller. It is. A, no, yeah. but he broke the rules of thrillers. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think you can because yeah. they're. I mean, how do you how do you thrill people except by breaking the rules, really? Exactly, and that's yeah. one thing we've always we've talked about in the past is once you know the rules, then you look, then you can start breaking them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, back to you, back to everybody on story structure. Do you, Fedora? I'm going to put you on. on since you do mystery, yeah. I'm going to do you first. Do you have a story structure that you follow? I only need to know three things. I need to know exactly when it is because I write historicals, mm -hmm. okay? And I always have to have research in the background to give details that are, you know, truly representative of the time and interesting. So I have to know exactly when it is. I have to know what the precipitating incident is or what, the, you know, the idea, mm -hmm. shall we say. And then I have to envision the black moment. The time when everything looks lost and people wonder, how the hell is she going to get out of this one? And I have to know that. After that, I can start writing and I'll go somewhere. Okay. Nice. Jen's already answered it from mm -hmm. her previous statement, so I'm going to Which go is not all that different from mine, I don't think. Yeah. Is it like, what do, what do I look for? Yeah, what, what, what do you have? Actually, you kind of sort of did answer this, but... You have a set story structure you always follow. Um, you know, like my personal favorite is the Hero's Journey template because that's something that I, you know, grew up watching and really, 
enjoying, and it's something that I feel like I have a, a strong, a strong hold on it. Um, and so when it comes to when it comes to you know the structure, the main things that I really look for when I'm ready to you know ready to start up is um, is the is the character someone that I believe is worth is worth following um, is the journey that they're going to be on I, is something that I feel I feel like I'm bringing something new to the table um, because the hero's journey is a very tried and true template. That's been used many, 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 many times. I understand that I'm basically just adding one more piece of paper to the top of a very large pile. But at the same time, this is my interpretation of it. That's, that was you know, the way that I kind of get around that. Um, and basically, like um, another thing that I really kind of look at is the villain. Um, is, that, is that somebody that I feel can match the protagonist because the way i see it is like the your villain is only as you know your protagonist is only as good as your antagonist uh -huh. if they have somebody that you know that the protagonist has to rise up to match then you got something really good there okay chanel Eek. um <laughs> So, That's a brand new story structure. It's called Eek. <laughs> and it, it's a very, it's an acronym. It's a very, yeah, it's very in depth. No, but fun. Uh, yes, actually, you're correct. As a new story structure, it's called I Have No Idea What the Hell I'm Doing. <laughs> and I'm just going to write as if my hands are on fire until someone tells me to stop. Um, actually, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I do. Um, so I guess it'd be like considered a zero. But uh, honestly, when I think in terms of story structure and somebody can cut me off on this or interject or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, part of the reason that I'm hesitant to use the word story structure and assigning myself to one of these little nice categories is it, 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 it makes me concerned um, because we talked earlier about um, being predictable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason that I don't like the idea of uh, subscribing to one of these story structures is because they are so generally well known and predictable. So I don't like to say, yes, I do XYZ thing because XYZ thing is something that people are generally used to and generally know, know uh, and can see it coming from a mile away. Um, so that's why I don't like to go into things planning on using a particular structure. Um, does it end up that way? Sure, sometimes, I guess. But if, if I think of it as, okay, I'm going to use structure that X plus Y equals Z. And then the entire time I'm just like, oh, God, X plus Y, I know this is coming. They're going to know this is coming. I, and then it kind of kills the joy in it for me. I agree. Um, one of the things that I, I would definitely, you know, kind of say is that is, you know, like, yes, you know, these templates are very, you know, can be very predictable. The fun part of it is basically like taking a brand new character and a brand new uh, universe and a brand new situation and everything and using that hero's journey, you know, say like, you know, case in point, hero's journey, using that as a guide makes things a little bit more palatable to the reader or, mm -hmm. you know, the audience because they can kind of, you know, they can kind of follow along and everything and not feel completely lost right at the very beginning. I hope if you're writing a good story that you're not trying to confuse your reader, though. Right. <laughs> trying Regardless to of what, what, it goes for. You know, what uh, structure you're using or, or trying to use or whatever, coherence is probably high on the list when you're writing anything, especially oh, yeah. if you're inventing a world. Yes, we want, I think readers in general want things that are very familiar, but at the same time different. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So put in those twists and those surprises on the typical structure and it won't be a typical structure anymore okay Melanie your turn well it was I was just uh, you were going over story structure and I was just thinking some of these are methods of what you were talking about were methods of plotting so for instance using the snowflake method is a way to write your novel but what you end up with might fall into any story structure because mm -hmm. the snowflake novel is all about process and has nothing to do with the end result. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it has I would to do with, how, with you there, it has to okay. do with how you get to the end result. You're right. Some of the steps do have to do with exciting incidences and all that. But um, yeah, it does, Snow, Snowflake does have the yeah, I forgot about other story steps. Other yeah, it does have other story structures built inside of itself. But I agree. Um, point is, a lot of the zero draft, basically the people that are just writing to write, and this is kind of what I do, is or try and do. Short story might be different, but I definitely need to know where I'm going and some nice big goalposts to how to get there. Like, you know, the big events that need to go there. And then I just try and put myself in the character's head and have them live their lives. And then you go back, and once you get the zero draft done, see if it's boring <laughs> and take out the boring bits and the bits that don't move the plot over. And then, you know, it might just incidentally fall into one of those other structures. I like the not boring as a structure. Yes. Yeah. See, yeah, I've got a problem there. As soon as I've written it, now I'm bored with it. I like editing. <laughs> I know, but that's what I'm saying. Yeah. The moment I'm done writing it, I'm bored with it. Yeah. I want to talk about another story structure altogether. Go for it. Which is, uh, actually, I see two or three different types of similar story structures. Actually, so and well, that is... Uh, kind of interleaving. Perhaps you have seen those in which you have two character stories that devoted one chapter to one character and then the other character or three yes. characters or mm -hmm. however many you have. And they all see this perhaps the same thing in a different way. And eventually there, there's some resolution where they all get together. You might call that a, a chunky kind. I'm not sure. Uh, something similar is the groundhog phenomenon <laughs> where they keep replaying the same <laughs> thing mm -hmm. day after day with a little twist every time. Mm -hmm. So you get the same thing over and over again. And also there are some that are simply episodic like various television programs where uh, I'm thinking of the librarians where you have the librarians all of the time, but they go someplace exotic and do a thing. Uh -huh. And then they go another place exotic and do another exotic thing with magic. So that all of these sort of exotic or interleaving ones is its own sort of structure, loose though it might be. Well, in fact, let me ask that question, ask the question. Is it my imagination or do all story structures share the same elements? It's just a question of how you define the plot line. And that's going to raise up another something here in a moment. And so. how you organize them, what order mm -hmm. you put them in. I think, yes, there are some very common ones. Certainly, uh, mystery is one. Mm -hmm. We want to know the unknown. I mean, why do you read anything? To see what it says, mm -hmm. right? To see what's there. Mm -hmm. So that is one. Romance is pretty high up on the list, though it may not have to exist in everything. And uh, a bit of sparkle comes from the unusual. I would say those are all elements that we do well to put in. Go ahead. Um, I actually want want to th want to throw something out there as well. Something that um, um, I'm curious to know, like um, from everyone else, like if they have any sort of series in mind, and how do they structure that? Is it something that is, you know, self-contained? You know, like where your character is going from one story to another, but at the same time, each story itself is self-contained, so to the point where somebody can just pick up any one of them and start from there and not get lost? Yeah. Or is it something that is episodic to the point where there is like a progression as they go on and maybe even a couple of cliffhangers, you know, like within? I've got my answer, but I'll let anybody else go for it. Yeah, well, I was thinking of very, about a very successful series author, and that's a Janet Ivanovich, who writes the same book over and over and over again, as I have often said. But they're all so funny and so delightful that we don't mind. And she just she just plunks them down. They're all they all seem to be at the same time, happening at the mm -hmm. same time. There's not a timeline mm -hmm. uh, to that anyone can There's suggest. There's a little bit of progression, but only a little bit. <laughs> right. She's always the same age. It has been for the last what fifteen years mm -hmm. since she's been writing these books. No so, birthdays <laughs> exist. Exactly. And the guys are still young and hot, and Stephanie is too. And Lula looks the same. You know. Nothing ever changes in her world. Also, of course, there are those that have timelines, like William Faulkner, 
who would have a whole bunch of stories about one family and take them through the Civil War all the way up to the 1930s. So there's certainly more than one way of doing series, but those are two that strike me as being fairly successful. Well, Bernard Carmel, if I get the guy's name right, who did uh, Sh- Sharps, the Sharps series. Yes. Sharps Tiger, Sharps Rifles, mm-hmm. Sharps Trafalgar. I'm really got it out yeah. of order here. Bean but... did that. Yeah. Played that part. Yep. So, and to answer your question on mine, okay, I'm working on the first novel in the series. But mm-hmm. the goal is, yes, it's going to be more episodic in the sense of you don't have to have read book one to understand what's going on in book five. Mm-hmm. But they are going to be interchanged and interconnected because while in the first book the, th- the thrust is a bounty hunter who can find a million things worth dying for has to find something worth living for. Mm-hmm. That's the tagline. But guess what? That's the entire tagline, at least as far as I've got in my head, of the entire series. He's always going to be adapting and changing what is it he is actually wanting to live for. Mm-hmm. And I could tell you... Well, actually, the first one is Justice, and then he's going to find a perversion of Justice in the next book. Mm-hmm. And it's because, like, okay, wait a minute here. What is Justice? Yeah. So, and, yeah, he's hunting, actually, it's kind of a driving force right now of, as every day I go back and I work on the story, this is what it is. This is this theme has got to be constantly repeated. Mm-hmm. And what I'm trying to do with my story structure is make it more of an onion, which is something I was going to talk about. Plot structure versus character-driven plots. Mm. I think sometimes plot structure, story structures we've been talking about, forces a very robotic, while it doesn't address expectations, forces a robotic um, form on the story instead of something being generally biological. Um, Let me use an example. And I love um, Agatha Christie's work, but a lot of times her characters were very much pieces on a chessboard. Mm-hmm. They moved like Jesus on the be- Jesus pieces on a chessboard. <laughs> Strike that! Right. I caught that. <laughs> okay. Um, and one of one of my favorites of of Agatha Christie was when I saw the play um, Black Coffee. And it was the way I don't know if this was intentional, if there's just if there is a clue in the actual script, or if this was just somebody just did this by accident. But in the movie, or I'm sorry, in the in the play, the murder occurs, lights go off, lights come back on, and Hercule Poirot steps into the I don't remember what room it was. But he steps in there. And he's, and if you would imagine the floor, he's on he's on a staircase coming down. But the floor itself is a marble chessboard. Is mm-hmm. what it looks like, black and white pieces. And knowing how Agatha Christie was with her writing, being very chess-like, mm-hmm. seeing him stepping down, it's like here comes now the hero stepping down onto the board. Mm-hmm. So I, I absolutely love that scene. But I think that character-driven stories are more organic and or are onions. Um, probably one of my favorites is a novella, Ethan Throne. And you get a lot of inferences of theme throughout the whole thing. But if you read the story closely, is literally pulling back the layers of the characters mm-hmm. as they go through the journey. And it feels like you, it makes you want to cry because you're peeling back so many layers, mm-hmm. even though it's a very short one. Yeah, I was just saying that uh, Lois McMaster of Bourgeois has a definition of what separates a standalone novel, mm-hmm. a series, and an epic novel. Mm-hmm. An epic novel is Tolkien, Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Basically, mm-hmm. each novel is not a story in itself. You basically can't understand novel number two really without reading novel number one first. Mm-hmm. Standalone novel is what it is. It's a standalone novel. There's, but a series, 
A series is something very specific. Oh, and by the way, Stephanie Plum, even though it's technically a series, would more or less fall under her definition. It's, cl it's close to being a standalone novel, but it meets her definition of a series, barely. Her definition of a series, you can pick up any book anywhere and understand it. It's a complete story in and of itself. But if you read the other books of the story, it develops, there, basically there's a plot within each book mm -hmm. that makes sense and it's complete. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if you read all of the series, there are overarching development that occurs during the series. Like right. the Harry Potter uh, series. Yes. Yeah. Because like each book, each book symbol, um, symbolizes one year at Hogwarts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, like everything starts and ends pretty much the same, pretty much the same way. Even, mm -hmm. um, even book seven. Mm -hmm. Even though, like, the structure of that one is uh, vastly different than, than the other six books, there is, still, um, there is still that feeling of, you know, like, by the, you know, before, the, before the school year begins and as the school year ends. And each one has their own specific story, you know, designated to them. But then at the same time, like, there is that overarching story of... Eventually, like you know, Harry Potter meeting his meeting his destiny and finally having his you know face off with Lord Voldemort. Um, that's I did not speak his name. Well, yeah, he's dead. <laughs> he's dead. So him. yeah, it's okay. <laughs> I have no problem. Um, talking about it. And I, I'm actually going to be doing uh, two different types you know types really? of that because um, obviously from parts unknown, the way that it's the way that it's structured is very serialized. So you need to you need to have read them. In the order to fully understand them, mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, there is you know there there it they are very you know the the stories are structured so that you know like each one really kind of has like its own start start and finish mm -hmm. with their own little cliffhanger to get them to each one. You know it just depends on how extreme the one you know they are mm -hmm. as they as they go along. Um, but at the same time, you know, the best way to read that one would no, no doubt be to read from books one through five. I just hope and pray that when they come out, people do. Um, <laughs> when it comes to, when it comes to Excelsior, I followed the, the sort of trilogy set up that Lucas did with Star Wars, mm -hmm. where, you know, like, part one, you introduce the characters, part two, you put your characters into the deepest hole imaginable, and part three, they get out of that hole. Mm -hmm. Um... Now, what I did with book two is I, you know, not to spoil anything, um, I put a little tag right at the very end, which symbolizes a cliff, a bit of a cliffhanger. But I still believe that you can read part two and get a full experience and everything without having to, you know, be like, you know, wanting to beat me up because I didn't write part three yet. Um, I feel like you can get that full, you know, that full experience with, with that. Um, another series that I plan on picking up and everything, that's going to be very episodic to, you know, so that way, you know, just like, um, you know, much smaller stories mm -hmm. that are going to be very self-contained, you know, so it's going to be fun playing in that, in that field. Okay. Um, anyone else? Well, I'll say one thing that, uh, about... <laughs> Uh, Eileen Dreyer often spoke to the romance writers and people mm -hmm. would ask her questions, particularly about how to write a good query letter and that kind of thing. And she said, well, the first thing is to get a track record because my query letters these days are, I have an idea about who it is and uh, I'd say a little bit about each character and then I'd say, and they go on and do some things and then get together. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, you know, story structure it goes with whoever you're writing it. I agree. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes story structure is used to teach more than it is mm -hmm. in the plotting mode. Yeah. There are people, uh, there are authors who do use a story structure to plot. There's, I'm not saying it that way. I'm saying that we as writers, A, we find our story structure uh, throughout our entire writing career and each story can have a different story structure and sometimes <sighs> kind of changing changing the simile here but or changing the not the simile yeah. changing yeah change the metaphor thank you is the author wrote down those blue curtains the teacher talks about 
oh, the blue curtains represent blah, blah, blah. And the author said, no, no. They were just blue. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> so sometimes I think there's a structure or a interpretation of structure that is the reader's expectation of that structure. And they're sitting there going, hmm, we, I must now be in the act two midpoint because, oh, we just had some weird thing. And the author's like, no, that weird thing just happened at about right at that time. To be fair, a lot of times authors put those things in subconsciously because they've absorbed some of these structures. Exactly, yeah. what, exactly, <laughs> exactly what I was going to yes. say next. Yeah. So, does anyone else have anything else on story structure or have we beaten it to death? Uh, just... Just basically to kind of play off of what uh, what you guys were were saying before, like the beautiful thing about these rules, mm-hmm. we can say, um, which you know, like you said, you know, it's at the end of the at the end of the day, that's kind of what all these different structures are. They're all their own set of rules mm-hmm. or guidelines. You, I yeah. think of them as guidelines. Yeah, as <laughs> as Peter Venkman said, actually, it's more of a guideline than a rule. <laughs> <Yes>. Right. <laughs> but um, the. Wonderful thing about them is that you know like, is what you do with those once you've learned how to, how to use them. Um, just like you said, like you know, once you learn how, once you learn these rules, then you can go ahead and sh- you know twist them to your own designs. Mm-hmm. But you just you know like, the fact that you just say like, oh, I want to do, I want to write this type, you know, of story. You got to know what that is. You have to know what that what goes into that exactly. specific type of structure. And then you can go ahead and make your changes and twists and mess with people's expectations and everything. But just like with every, just like with everything in life, you know, like once you once you know the rules, then you can twist them to your own design. Also, it's a big help in selling them because if you give an agent or an editor something and they don't know how the hell to market it, oh yeah, oh yeah, they're going to turn you down. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's just about that simple. You might, you know, eventually get an audience yourself by self-publishing it but that's just a reality of the market if they don't know how to sell it they're not gonna buy it and it's something for the author as well the author has to know how to sell it you know that was something that um i've heard you david you know Mm -hmm. talk about uh before how you were able to give advice to a writer who didn't exactly know how to sell his own story right and once you gave him that sort of guideline for him to go by then all of a sudden he had success exactly so that's one of that's that's where these rules come you know come in handy you have to know what these things are and you have to know how to tell your own story because if you don't know how to tell your own story then no one's going to know yeah no one's going to care to know let's right. put, let's, let, let's put the truth to there if you cannot explain your story in an interesting way to somebody listening, and you've heard us talk about elevator pitches, mm-hmm. so throw the structure in the elevator pitch if you can. If you can't explain your story in an elevator pitch to someone else, I don't care if it's an agent or publisher or person who's willing to have you sign their book, they're not going to be that interested. Yeah. You've got to be able to explain it to them. That's why movie executives have that twenty-five words or less. Yep. You know, uh, standard. That's why um, I like to put. I like to keep my you know the the blurb on on the back of my books to a hundred words or less. You know, just the same sort of thing. You've got to keep it as condensed as possible to make sure that that the most amount of readers mm-hmm. will understand it. You don't want to talk down to them no you don't want to be like you know be like you're playing the lowest common denominator but you want to be able to give them like the you know at least like a good strong outline without meandering and going on for like paragraphs i mean you don't want to be like yes my book i wrote my novel i wrote is based on a literary style of the grapes of wrath and i explore the uh, turtles Crossing the road. You are as, awesome. as, yeah, yeah, exactly. I did that on purpose. <laughs> Ultimately, Steinbeck really suffers at your hands. You know he that. does. <laughs> and you know the sad thing is, I'd probably be able to sit across from him and be able to drink coffee or something a lot stronger. But he'd probably get along despite my err at him. You look like a truck driver. I think you know that probably yeah. you'd be able to get along. He's that, like, common Joe kind of guy. Wait a minute, you're saying I look like a truck driver. Moving on. No, I'm <laughs> saying you should look like an ordinary person. I'm teasing you. <laughs> I'm teasing you. Ultimately, though, whatever you do, you need to understand your story. And I th- through that understanding, if there is a story structure there, you know the story structure. If there's that one there, 
make it up. Mm -hmm. uh, and be able to use that story structure to sell your book. And on that note, unless I have any final thoughts coming from anyone else in the group, mm -hmm. looking at my wife. Okay. <laughs> Have a great week writing, and tune in next week for yet another interesting topic in the writing industry. Thank you for listening. Did you know that Write Pack Radio has an international audience? How would you like to reach that audience in regards to your books, your book services, your author services, or more? Go to www.windingtrailsmedia.com and look under advertising for more information. If you don't have a script, that's not a problem. We will be happy to work with you. Once again, go to www.windingtrailsmedia.com for more information. The new theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her.